Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Pierre Langlois. I co-chair the, uh, the, the session. Uh, small introduction. I've been in the NDT business since 28 years. I was with uh, RD Tech, which became uh, Olympus NDT. Uh, I'm the one who introduced the phase array inside RD Tech 20 years ago with the focus, with the partnership with the IZFP at that time. Um, Reminds me of the ECNDT, <coughs> reminds me of the first introduction also in Barcelona. Those were there 12 years ago, introduction of the OmniScan. So I'm called also the father of the OmniScan. And I'm glad to see that uh, today's phase array get a full room of uh, attendees. So it's a very, very, very good to see that. Uh, the first presentation will be, uh, I was supposed to do it, but since I'm chairing, uh, I will let uh, one of my colleagues, Mr. André Lamar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, everybody. I'm very glad to be here today to talk to you about the phaser technology. So this presentation will be about the roadmap that we have to go through to get the phaser technology into the market. So the content uh, will go like this. Uh, we're gonna discuss the early days of phase array, then the, from phase, the phase array technology to the market, then the deployment of the technology, and finally some word on the future. So uh, this, is, this is the story that, uh, that we all live together as part of RD Tech and Olympus. I would like just to make a comment here is we do not pretend to have uh, invented phase array was there, there was a lot of work going on, and there's all, there was also many companies that are working to get the phase array technology to the market. So I'm sure that many of you have very interesting story about phase array that you would like to hear. So uh, this one would be our story. So just in case somebody is back from a trip to March, um, what is phase array? Well, we can explain it very quickly. I had a colleague that used to explain it just like this. You do this with ultrasonic beam and this with ultrasonic beam. It's very clear. But in fact, what we do is we modify the characteristic, characteristic of the acoustic beam of a probe made of multiple small elements. So I think everybody knows that in the room. So I will not go too far with that. So it's the capability to do a sector scan and also uh, at different angles, rather than L waves, shear waves, or to do linear scan over a long array. Very briefly, some historical background. The phase array theory was developed for antenna and radar. In the 50s, it was applied uh, to sonar to be able to inspect the, 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 the ocean. In the 70s, it started some medical application uh, that uh, are very, very interesting and it keep evaluated. In the 80s, uh, research lab <coughs> applied phase array to NDT. Here I have some name as IZFP and BAM were involved into that. And in the 90s, we saw the commercialization of phase array instruments for the NDT market. So some word about the early day uh, where we were learning the technology. So where we start was in 1993. Yeah, we start, in fact, it was a project, it was not really the idea of doing a product at that time, was a project that we uh, worked with uh, IZFP, uh, where the idea was to connect the phaser instrumentation to the thermoscan. So the thermoscan at that time was that unit here. Oops. It's the unit that you see uh, right here. So this was a commercially available EUT system, but there was no phase array function on this. So the project was to integrate a phase array unit for one project. So at that time, the system was capable of doing only sector scan, use only 16 elements, pro, for emission and also for reception. And the, the, the higher frequency that can be used with that system was five megahertz. So the application that was used was a very challenging application, in fact. In fact, probably one of the most challenging applications I've seen over the 20 years, in fact. So this application was to inspect a turbine disk using phase array, but to perform time-of-flight diffraction over a distance that was about one meter. 
So one meter away with two probes, we were able to do sector scan and perform time of flight diffraction and find flaws in the turbine disk. So after that project, of course, we realized that hmm, there might have something to do with a product like this. Is there, is there a, a need on the market for that? So we built the first generation, what the name was Atomoscan Phaser. So in that case here, it was 95, was the first commercialization phased array unit from RDT at that time. So the first phased array unit available on the market. So this whole system that you see here, the total weight was about probably uh, 50 pounds or more uh, of all this. And with, you can see that you had uh, many different units. So it was connected again to the thermoscan. So now we had a package totally, uh, you know, all packaged together that works with the scan. but now we were able to drive 32 elements up to 128. So rather than just doing a sector scan with that system, we were able to do sector scan with 32 elements, but also a linear scan over 128 elements. Today, it seems so obvious to do something like that, but at that time, it was perfectly new. First time that the linear scan was uh, available. Also, we can use probe up to 20 megahertz, where in reality, in fact, the higher frequencies that we can manufacture probe is around 17 and 18 uh, megahertz. So, um, at that point, we were learning the technology. So, we had to move from what we know, knew about NDT from one single beam to multiple beams. So how to calculate the focal loss? So we had to uh, figure out and how to calculate the focal loss, what was the right way, or should I say, a good way to, uh, to calculate focal loss. Uh, the type of wave that were involved, L wave, shear wave, also all the mode conversion that come with, comes with that. So we need to uh, understood that uh, quite clearly. And the probe definition, how to define a probe. We're gonna see that uh, later. Also, uh, there was some things that were required for the technology to be accepted. The NDT uh, company or the NDT user were asking to get a scan. They are also asking to get gate to be able to gate the information, and also to use TCG or, or DAC, and also how to perform a calibration. How can we make sure that all the beams have the same sensitivity? What kind of calibration block should be used, and so on and so on. So there was a lot a uh, thing to think about and work with here. Also, uh, to understand the physics, come back to the focal loss calculation. Uh, fortunately, we had access to uh, beam modeling. At that time, there was, uh, we were using a uh, PASS software that was done by University of Paris, I guess, Paris and five. also Paris 5, Paris five. Uh, where we were using SIVA at that time, I'm not sure, but later on, we, we use uh, SIVA. So this, uh, the beam modeling was extremely helpful uh, to, uh, to design a probe, because build a new probe, there was not a lot of probe manufacturer at that time. Uh, every time it was a new probe, it could take months to have a probe. Uh, so it was not very quick, so we need to be more reactive. So by doing beam modeling, uh, we were able first to understand the physics of what's going on, and also to design probe that meet the requirements of the inspection of our customers. So as an example here, uh, you see uh, the effect of uh, the bandwidth on side lobes, or even grating lobes, and also uh, the propagation of the phased array uh, beam. Because now we have, in fact, 16 or 32 beams that we phase together. So this is different things that adding just one beam that travel at one specific angle so uh, learning the technology again is understanding the parameters influence. Talking about the probe, the relationship between the size of element and the frequency. I guess today it's obvious for everyone, but it was not so uh, obvious at that time that there was a relationship that for a specific frequency, smaller is your element, larger you have the beam spread, and vice versa. So, and this had, of course, a huge influence on the probe design. The, the, also, the, uh, the effect of number of elements. When you use, to create a beam, if you use 8, 16, or 32 elements, as we can see here as an example, we see that the beam is, is more focused when we use more elements. 
More focus is it always a good thing? This is not a thing that we have to uh, worry about. If your focus very strongly at one point, then your depth of field is very short. So you might miss some indications that are not located at the, at the focal point. So and most of the time, nobody is really uh, inspecting only one area. We want to inspect larger areas. So we have to work on that also to define how to calculate the focal loss. And the effect of dead elements, this is still something that is going on. If you use a, a group of 16 elements as, a, as an example, how many elements can be dead? Because this is a fact. Elements on phase of your probe die. So how many elements can you accept? So is it two? Is it three? We're still, we're still, there's still some uh, debate about that. But mostly we can say that three elements over a, a group of 16 elements is acceptable. Also, uh, to manage the key char characteristic, the emerging point. So how do you uh, define the emerging point to be able to um, get the picture? In fact, what you want to do all the time is to see where is the indication in the volume. So for that, you need to know very well the delay in the wedge and where is the exit point as well. And the calibration, uh, how to perform with um, the calibration for all the different beams and the, and the TCG apply, also we have to uh, work on it. And now we have to face phase array practical issues. Wedge echoes. With a single probe on a wedge, it's easy to eliminate the wedge echo because you have only one beam, you can <coughs> see where is the reflection in the wedge and design your wedge accordingly. When you do a sector scan, you might have 50 different beams that travel at different angles. So to design the wedge to make sure that you have no wedge echoes, never at all the angles that the user is going to use, it's, quite, it's a very challenging issue. And it is still a challenging issue. The coupling. Now that we have probe with many elements, we have larger wedge. So how to couple a large wedge to the surface and make sure that you always have a good contact or fluid between the wedge and the probe to have good propagation was also a challenge. And not talking about the enemy, the grading loads, really the enemy of phase array. Never know where, it, where it's going to be. It's, it, it's always there. If your elements are too large and you're trying, you're trying to steer, you're going to have grading loads in the, in the uh, region of interest that might just kill your inspection. Also, the steering capability uh, of the probe is always uh, something that uh, we have to, to work with. And again, the probe design, find out that you would like to have a lot of elements with a small pitch, but unfortunately, the electronic doesn't allow you to do that, so you have to make a compromise. You, have to, you need a certain aperture, so you need the element to be as small as you can, depending on what kind of steering you want to achieve. So this is the art of compromise. There is no universal uh, phase array pro. Maybe one day there will be when we're going to have electronics with uh, thousands of elements. But for now, it's still the art of compromise. And at that time also, there was no standardization. It means that every time we were working on an application for one client, we had to do one custom pro and one wedge design all the time. So that the, the reaction time to be able to, to respond to the customer was very long because there was no standardization at that time. And this was a limiting factor for expansion because there was too many discussion between the engineer from both sides until we finally get to a solution. And it required also extensive user support because everything I talk about here was unknown by the people at that time, most of the people at that time. So now we went to a second step which is bringing the technology to the market. So. Then came the second generation, which is the Thomascan Focus in 1956. So this was the first RDTech phase array unit. So you can see here two different models. Um, the aperture, we were able to use up to 32 elements, over 256 elements, meaning that we can use 128 elements as pulsar, 128 elements as receiver. Can perform sector scan and linear scan and use probe up to 20 megahertz. This one was using a PC, a PC, which was new at that time, with a PC-based software named Tomovio. So with this, uh, we were able to uh, learn from the, from the industry. So we collaborate with industries. 
This is an example here of a working group that we did with the nuclear industry leaders in the world. So we had people from Japan, Europe, and the United States, and Canada involved in that group, and other countries, but I forget. Uh, so with this, we were able to get the information from the industry, and so to transfer the technology and the knowledge to the industry. So we learned the industry needs that could benefit from this technology. And we explore the benefit of advanced phase array technique. So you can see here a picture of a TRM, Time Reversal Mirror Working Group in 1997. So we explored at that time advanced technique. So where were they? They were dynamic depth focusing, which you can see an example on the left. So the nice capability to keep a long focus beam over a long distance. We also explored VFT, volume focusing, auto focusing, and time reversal mirror. So this exploration was um, very interesting for us, but in fact, we didn't keep at that time any of those advanced techniques, and we keep moving with the uh, conventional phase array technique to bring it to the market. So uh, again, we had to build, or we, we work on building a knowledge base. Some might call it a uh, uh, books, or body of knowledge, so that we, people can refer have book to learn about it, to understand what's going on, to build training course, training exam, and to, to learn about this technology. So we took the very good example of uh, Kurt Kramer, which was the Bible, and is still the Bible, of, uh, of NDT. Uh, but we took that example and create a similar book. No, not similar book. I don't want to say similar book. It's, I would say uh, books that are, we're focusing on phase array uh, technology. And these are free to download on, uh, on the website. And there are still a reference uh, for the NDT in phase array. Training the industry. I don't know, at that time, we were overwhelmed with training. We had so many training to do that we just we were just unable to catch up with all the training to do. And also, at the same time, I realized that we were not inspectors. We were very bad trainers. I mean, to train uh, inspector was really not uh, a cup of tea. But there was a need for the training, and uh, we created a training academy with uh, industry partners. Uh, you can see, if you go on the website, you're going to have the, the full list of all the, uh, the, the trainer uh, that uh, can train on the Omniscan or any phase array uh, equipment. So there was, this, this is was very good. Uh, it was good for both parties. It was good for us. It was good for the training company and for the operator because it really uh, contribute a lot to spread the technology uh, over the market. And it also, uh, working with those training group helped also for to the technology acceptance. And there's still a high demand for scale operator. In fact, it's something that we have all together to work on is to have a better uh, operator on the market. There's a good need for that. Now we... Uh, had to show benefit through application. So we're expanding by developing application in different industries. It's always on the sound, but it's applied differently in aerospace than in pipeline. As you know, our bridges different worlds. Some power generation application that we worked through at that time was 97, uh, was with uh, Ontario Power Generation for the inspection of complex geometry of Siemens L0 blade root. Um, this the trick was a tricky inspection because the inspection has to be done by the, uh, the hand of the blade root right here and then get the flaws and record the diffraction, tip diffraction as we can see here okay, in the volume, image it to be able to size the indication and also its orientation. It was very challenging and very interesting uh, so this is me here with a colleague in 97. So we were doing tests on site. We learned a lot, and we bring the technology to the power generation uh, with the navigation like this. <clears throat> Aerospace also was an uh, early user of uh, the phase three technology. Friction stairwell for rockets. Uh, again, this is a, a way to, to, to weld the aluminum together. So you see a picture here. So this is, this is at uh, Boeing, in fact, in one of the Boeing plant. So this is uh, 
50 feet, 50 feet high, so we're at the top of the well for the scatter with two phaser probe like this. Just move down and back to the, to the top of the well. So with this, we're able to do the full well coverage in one pass using a phaser probe like this that was doing a linear scan with a shoe, a water shoe that was sitting on the well, one probe on each side, one pass, full coverage. It was awesome. So we're able to find lack of penetration, warm hole, and different defects. You can see here by imaging how easy it was to, to size the indication when you get the right imaging. It was also a very good learning experience. Pipeline. The use of phase array on pipeline. It's, it's, pipeline is a very demanding and high productivity uh, uh, world. <laughs> Especially uh, offshore, because when the weld is gone, it's gone. It's in the sea. You cannot come back to repair. You can, but it's so expensive, you want to avoid that. So what phase the rebrand brand, brand, brand to this is, is, is this. In fact, the system that was used before for, for current weld inspection was using conventional probe, up to 20 conventional probe. was working fine. Each of these probe was inspecting a specific zone of the weld. So it was very um, high uh, precision uh, tool, but you had to uh, adjust 20 probes. You have to deal with 20 probes. So you can see the size of the, of the probe holder here, all the cables and so on. So there was a need here to simplify all this. So you see we moved from 80 pro, uh, excuse me, 20 probes, two phase array probe, and a pair of tough. Much lighter, much easier to put in place. Calibration was faster was perfect tool for uh, the use of phase array. So it was fully automated gradual inspection with the comprehensive imaging like this, where you see all the different zones of the weld. And when you see this, the operator very quickly can see that there is a critical indication right there. Come back and make a repair. And this is an application as well, inline tube inspection. So this is a very high productivity system has to be able to work 24 hours 7. Again, here, the, the same system was used to do linear scan, also parallel firing. The main inspection, main application at that time was ERW weld and full body. So it needs to be reliable, reliable and it's a go-no-go -go system. There's no way that you're going to do an analysis on the sector scan. Or it, it's, it's a go-no-go, -go, it's alarm, it's good or it's not good. So it also was very good learning experience for the company. Now, we also have to work with the acceptance, industry acceptance by working on the code. And here, I pay tribute to uh, our colleague, uh, Michael Mose, uh, who passed away uh, a few months ago. Uh, for all the work he did here uh, to get the uh, technology accepted by the industry. Here, I have a few examples of uh, ESME code, but there's other codes where it's very clear now that we have codes that the phase array scan can be used and a scan can be used uh, to replace uh, X-ray in many uh, pressure vessels. So key learning from that, there was growing opportunity. So after 10 years of working with phase array, uh, the technique has shown very good benefit but it only occupied only a fraction of the potential market. So to the expand the technology, we target two things, the NDT operators and the service companies. So for that, we need to come with system, and they told us that we need to come with a system that will give portability, will be standard, standardized, easy to use, and with a price more affordable. So then we get to the phase of deploying the technology by launching in 2003 the OmniScan, so which is the portable phase array instrument that was the first time a standalone instrument, battery operated, capability up to 32128 PR, can drive 20 megahertz probe, sector scan, linear scan with wizard to do the setup and also calibration tool, DAC, and so on. So this is really a change I believe, uh, the, the, the phase of the, of the NDT. So it was very good, uh, very well accepted by the industry. But this was not enough. In order to this to be, to the, the unit to be used uh, freely everywhere, we also have to take care of different stuff as probe and accessories. So 
their, their quality and reliability. Cable. So now we are moving from one cable for one probe to a, a, a cable with 128 elements. There, were, there was some noise, so we had to work on the noise that was catching by this, uh, this cable. The connectors, connectors, nightmare connectors. So we, had, we work a lot with electronic connectors, but they have pins, so by very fragile pins, so by moving in and out, you break the, pin, you break the pins, you cannot use the probe anymore, you have to change the connector. So we moved away from pins connector to use other type of connector, like this, where you don't have, uh, you don't have any pins anymore. So it's less fragile, so you can go on site and be sure that you can do your inspection. The probes, the standard, also have to provide families of probe and wedges, because we cannot afford anymore to discuss for weeks about what probes should I use with my well. No, we say, now we have family of probes available that you can get in a few weeks, or even a few days now, uh, that fits very well for the applic uh, application. And the cost of the probe also was always a concern. So the idea was to work to reduce all manufacturing costs in order to be able to reduce the, the price on the market. Am I good? Am I... I would say another five minutes. If you want to leave some time for questions, I would say eight minutes, okay. five to eight minutes. All right. And also what was asked is to uh, package solution. Not all the user has the capability to, or time, in fact, to develop their own uh, solution. So why not use off-the-shelf solution? So we came with the, the Cobra scanner for tin wall pipe wells using two-phase array probes, uh, corrosion mapping with the hydroform, uh, carbon steel well with two-phase array probe with the well rover. So all this is pack example of package solution. Also, the, the portability bring really the technology in the field. Now it's used on pipeline, on the ditch. It's used on the aircraft hangar. Maintenance hangar for aircraft. It's used on refineries. So it really bring the, the portability really bring the technology to to the field. And now uh, we keep adapting the instrumentation, like the EPAC 1000i, the Scanner 6 was a smaller version, less expensive, but also meet the requirement of some inspection perfectly well, and the new one, the Omniscan NX2, which is an advanced uh, portable instrument. So in summary, we uh, uh, just launched it 20 years ago, so it's been uh, absolutely a nice, nice experience to uh, be involved into that for 20 years. So you can see the evolution of the different instruments, but this would have never been possible without the support of the codes, the work on the codes, the book, solution, training, the application, the probe standardization and uh, the industry collaboration would have been impossible to, to get to this point. So in conclusion, after 20 years, the phase three technology has achieved market acceptance and has proven to provide value and benefits to the industry. The codes for phase three inspection are now recognized by the industry worldwide. There are several suppliers of phase three instrumentation, so now you have choice between different suppliers. Along with time of flight diffraction, Phaser is one of the few technologies to gain the acceptance of the NDT industry in the past 40 years. It's still very active. Here you can see the number or the quantity of patents that were granted about Phaser over the last uh, 10 years. So in 99, you got about 30 patents that were granted. In 2013, 2014, 100 patents granted. So all about Phaser for NDT. So it's still very active. So where is, what is next? What, what do we hear these days? We, we, we hear sound, we hear four metrics capture, total focusing method, nonlinear acoustic, subharmonic phase array, and so on. What will the industry use in the future? The technology adding values that meet the industry needs. Thank you. So we have a few times for questions. If there is any questions, please uh, go to the microphone. We have uh, 10 minutes for question session.
So what really made the breakthrough uh, for phase three? Was it the code acceptance? Was it the, ex the acceptance in the industry? What would you say is a real breakthrough in the development of phase three? I would say it's both. It's all together. It's all together. The codes, uh, the acceptance of the industry is so mixed together that it's, it's, it's both of them. Both of them. I, I, since I made the presentation, yeah, go ahead. I will just say that one of the things is that uh, market acceptance kind of, the, 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 the early adopter, those who have, because they have pushed the code, they have really pushed, the code has more react to that. And, and yes, the, the, the code acceptance spread the technology. Yeah. But it is really the industry, the end users, that push the code. Like we said, for uh, just an example, for the aerospace business, it's more the, uh, the airline that pushed the manufacturer to get that in, include in their uh, procedure so they can save money and save time. So it's really, and I'll re-mention it, it's really a, a global industry collaboration to get the benefits because all the industries saw the benefits. That's the only way the, any technology will succeed. Yeah, I, to... I fully agree. Any more questions uh, from the room, from the auditorium, or remarks? If this is not the case, thank you very much again. It was a very. Mm -hmm.